For reasons that utterly escape everyone involved, you're listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. Here are your hosts, Gabe Howard and Michelle Hammer. Welcome to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. My name is Gabe Bipolar. And I am Michelle. I have schizophrenia. And today our topic is, we are going to prove to you that even though we don't have active symptoms of our diagnosis, that we are in fact totally nuts. We get a lot of email, which, which shows that the show is great. Yeah. But yeah. A, so sometimes the emails are kind of like, you don't have this mental illness. How can you speak so well if you, have, if you have a mental illness? You can't be doing this well. You must be faking. Why are you faking? But no, trust us, <laughs> we are not faking. Just, just listen to some of the stories we can share or spend any time with me. Trust me, I'm not faking. The, the first thing that we should say is, I love that people think that they can listen to an edited podcast and diagnose. Like, like that's, how, that, that's how it's done. We don't record if we're symptomatic. We make sure that we are our best selves before we start the show, we have a layout, a plan, we have show notes, but listen, we're gonna lay it all on the table. We've each got three stories of us at our craziest. Michelle? Oh, I'm going first. I want you to tell me about the time that God spoke to you. Okay, so I'm gonna share this God story. The thing is, I don't usually tell this story because everybody looks at me like Biddy. You're freaking crazy. So I don't really share this story, but I can tell you when I was 22, I went on the birthright Israel trip. Those of you who don't know what birthright Israel is, when between the ages of 18 and 26, you can go on a free trip to Israel where you go on a full tour. They bring you around everywhere. They teach you the whole thing. Well, I'm 22. I'm unmedicated. Didn't know I was schizophrenic yet. Was still told I was bipolar, but I was off my bipolar meds. And I would go on this Israel trip. It's very nice. It's very lovely. And we went to the Western Wall, the Kotel, the Wailing Wall. Basically, it's the holiest place you can go for all the Jews. And we're with like Israeli um, army people. And they're all saying, you know, when you touch the wall, you can feel it. You can really feel it at the wall. And I'm like, okay, interesting. And the thing is, you're supposed to write things down on a piece of paper and stick it in the wall. So I wrote some things down on a piece of paper and you finally get to the wall because the boys have 75% and the girls get 25% sidebar. I put the paper in the wall. I'm touching the wall. My eyes are closed and I'm like, I'm trying to pray. And I'm like, if I'm going to pray anywhere, this is the holiest place. Okay. I'm just going to pray here. If anything's going to happen anywhere, it's going to be here. My eyes are closed and touching the wall. And I'm like, okay, what else do I need to pray about? What else do I need to pray about? And then all of the sudden, I felt something shoot through my head into my hands that were touching the wall. And it was like a divine moment of clarity. And then all of the sudden, I just knew. I knew what was most important in my life. I knew what I had to do with my life. I knew my meaning for earth. I knew knew what was most important. And it's like, it was like, God talked to me at the wall, but it wasn't a voice of God. It was a voice of realization that shot through my body and onto this wall. And as soon as I opened my eyes and took my hands off, it was gone. So it was like this weird divine moment where I'm telling you, something happened at this wall that gave me the most divine moment of clarity in my entire life. And when I tell people this story, they look at me and they're like, okay, yeah, you're schizophrenic. But I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't believe me? Go to the wall yourself. But don't other people that don't have a schizophrenia diagnosis have similar stories? I I am not Jewish, but in the Christian faith, we have people that have no mental illness that have stories of this. Now, God hasn't talked to the Pope, but of course he talked to Michelle Hammer. That makes sense. If I were God and I had to choose between the Pope and Rome or the Michelle Hammer, I'd pick you as well. But but I mean, what's up? I, just everybody that has this spiritual connection to God isn't mentally ill. There's a lot of these stories. Everyone I went on the trip with, I kind of thought it was cool. So I was like, hey, when I touched the wall, this happened. And they looked at me like, what? This didn't happen to anybody else. I've spoken to people. They touched that wall. Nothing happened to them. I know it happened. People think I'm crazy when I tell them this story. Nobody believes me. Nobody, nobody understands that this happened. 
trust me, I understand that I was an unmedicated schizophrenic girl, but this absolutely happened to me. I've never had more of a divine moment of clarity in my entire life. And the fact that when I opened my eyes and took my hands off the wall, it stopped means something happened to me. You can think I'm as crazy as you want to think. I know it happened. I believe that it happened. But do you believe that it was God or schizophrenia? I don't know if it was God or schizophrenia. A power shot through my whole body. I don't think it was schizophrenia, no, because I felt it through my whole body. When I hear schizophrenic noises and stuff, it's coming through the sides. I've never felt anything come through the top of my head and shoot through my arms. Did this wall have like electrical outlets and is it possible that you stuck your finger in one? No, it's just 2,000 years old. It happened. It happened, Gabe. It happened. Think I'm crazy. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. It's okay. It happened. I believe you that it happened because of schizophrenia. (laughs) Here's something else that happened. 20 years ago, I jumped off a roof. How high was the roof? It was a story high. It was, it was a one story roof. Uh, It was the garage roof. So I suppose it was a little under a story. My first house I, I bought when I was 20 years old and I, I was married and I was really, really excited to have a lot of parties there. Because you know, here I am, I'm 20 years old. I, I own this nice house. I'm, I'm feeling like a big shot and you I'm clearly manic. 20? Good I did. Good I know. I know, I know. That's why I always say it's not grandiose if you succeed. Well, I mean, how nice was the house? It was a good house. Where was it located? Dublin, Ohio. Yeah. You know nothing about Dublin, Ohio. Is don't, it don't. in Ireland? Is it in Ireland? No, it's not in Ireland. What? Just, just stop asking dumbass <laughs> questions. So I had a big party. My, my wife and I, my wife number one, we had a big party at the house. And there was, there, you know, there was lots of alcohol. There was lots of music. We invited the neighbors. And as, as it got later into the evening, people stopped paying attention to me. So at this point, picture a 500 pound guy, because you know, I was, I was fat as hell. And I climbed up onto the garage roof so that people would listen to me. So I'm yelling at them and I'm yelling, you know, pay attention to me and I'm, I'm waving. And somebody in the crowd, to this day, I honestly have no idea who, yelled, don't jump. You know, they were just being a, a, a smart ass. This is the kind of thing that you yell at somebody that's up high. But and I, yeah, <laughs> it, it put the idea right in my head. And, you know, and you, when you're in that mode and someone puts a bad idea in your head, you're like, I'm going to do it. I, I did. A great idea. That's all it took. And I took a couple of steps back and I kind of ran a little, which frankly probably saved me a broken bone because right below me was a sidewalk. Because I leapt a little, I landed in the middle of the yard, and it was kind of it was kind of the spring or fall. I don't really recall, but the the ground was a little mushy. I had lots of fat. I was you know twenty twenty one years old did at this. Belly flap. Yeah, I did. People laughed hysterically, and I just laid there, and everybody laughed, and it was funny, and I I didn't get hurt at all. I mean, I was a little bit sore, but. You jumped you know, off a roof. I did. I jumped off a roof. And, but I've had that same feeling when I've stood up higher, when I've stood at, you know, at the top of parking garages or, or hotels that have like roof access. I've had that same feeling. And ever since I was diagnosed and ever since I got well, I've always wondered if I was standing there and somebody below yelled, don't jump, would I have done it? I mean, I, I didn't put together that I'd be, I just assumed I'd be fine. The reality is, is if I did that exact same thing today, I'd break a bone. You know, I'm over 40 now. I don't have the padding. I'm lucky that I landed in a good spot. I didn't land on concrete. I didn't land on anybody. I landed right. I just, it's just luck that this is now a semi-funny story that I'm telling on a podcast. It could have turned out really bad. Were you on drugs? I, I Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was, I was definitely manic. I was definitely drinking and I'm, I'm sure that there were, there were recreational drugs involved and it all culminated into me leaping off a roof onto my lawn and I didn't get hurt. Well, that's good. You didn't get hurt, but you thought it was a really good idea at the time. I thought it was a really good idea at the time. Yeah. And I'm sure that, that I would do it again. I mean, I wouldn't do it again now, but I, I've done similar things that were just really, really bad ideas. But jumping off of a roof 
I guess it turned out okay. So it was my favorite. That's great. Okay. I've got another story, but we're going to have to, you know, really bring in the sadness, bring in the music, you know, bring down the tone. We're going to lower the lights. We're going to lower the lights. Yeah. If, if we had the budget, we would put like some violin music in the background. Mm, exactly. Exactly. All right. So back, back in the day, I used to do the slice and dice. But what I mean is the slice and dice. And what I mean by that is that I was a cutter. So it really didn't start till college. And then for some reason, I thought it would be a great idea to take the X-Acto knives from my art supplies and just start slicing myself up. Thought it was a great idea. Oh, I'm mad? Cut myself. Oh, I'm upset? Cut myself. Oh, I'm pissed off? Cut myself. Oh, I kind of, you know, anything. Any reasoning that I could come up with, I would just do it. And I thought it was a great idea. Sometimes I'd be punching the wall. Why are you punching the wall? No more punching the wall? Okay, I'll just cut myself instead. Oh, I'll do this instead. Every coping mechanism, anything I couldn't figure out, I'll just cut myself instead. But I can tell you I have not done that since October 3rd, 2009. Yay, almost a decade. Yeah. Yes. There's a, there's a, when it comes to cutting, for some reason, I feel like there's a lot of really cruel jokes surrounding cutting behavior. I, I don't know if it's because it predominantly affects young women. I, I don't know if it's just along the same lines as people just are just really mean to people with mental illness. But why do you think that people misunderstand cutting so much? Because a lot of things that I hear from people who cut is that they really get a large portion of the blame for it. Like, why don't you just stop? Why are you doing this? Nobody sees it as dangerous behavior. They see it as bad behavior or acting up. They don't see you as the victim. They see you as the, the thing is it, as almost it, the perpetrator. It's really dangerous behavior because it's almost like, gateway like you start with cutting and then what do you do next it's like it's like the first step of the red flag that's what that's what like I was learned that's what I was taught and you know find find count the red flags see what's going to get you to you know get into the psych ward again see cutting is one of those red flags and that's what you learn so if you blame the victim and just tell them to stop it's not going to do anything you have to make people realize that that's a huge red flag and what are you going to do next so when you get upset try to kill yourself next are you going to die or are you going to end up in the hospital? Like, why are you doing this to yourself? Try to figure out the reason why. Try to figure out another coping mechanism because you could end up in a really bad position. You could end up really scarred. And really, in the end, you're, you're just left with memories that are really bad because you have scars because of that. Do you have scars, Michelle? I do, but a lot of them are white and faded. Why do you think you adopted that particular coping mechanism? You know. I, I needed some type of coping mechanism. I, I would run a lot. I would run all the time to try to like help, but like, you know, sometimes you just can't run all the time. So, I mean, I, I had exacto knives from my art classes and I would just thought that it would be a good idea. And I, for a while it was a good idea. And then I realized what happened next after I started doing that for a while. Oh, this is really a bad idea because it got me into the hospital then it's kind of like you realize the steps and then it's kind of like, I don't know, you just don't, I don't know why I thought it was a good idea when it wasn't a good idea. And then, you know, you just kind of learn how bad it really is. It's just not, not a good coping mechanism, not a good thing to do. It, what it's like addictive. Quit? What helped me quit? I, I will on October 3rd, 2009, I did it really, 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 really bad. And it was left with some really red purple scars which I could not hide. So I was like, that's never happening again because I did this to myself because of what stupid reason. And now I'm stuck with a memory. When you saw that scar, what did you do? I mean, did you literally just look at it and say, oh, it's mind over matter and I'll stop? Or did that finally propel you into a hospital or a doctor or a therapist where you started taking the illness more seriously? You know, it, it just came to a point where I had done it so bad that I couldn't hide it. I told my lacrosse coach about it. She knew about it. And it was just kind of like, I'm, I'm done with this. I need to take my medicine the right way. So this never happens ever again, really. So you, you had been prescribed medication that you weren't taking right, but instead were sort of using cutting in place of the medication and you you realized that yeah I, I realized that like that day I had not taken my medication and looked what look what happened to me so I was kind of like okay this is what happens when I don't take a medication 
it was kind of a catalyst to, I need to take care of myself because this is ridiculous. This is not okay. I mean, thank God I am, you know, first aid certified because I was a lifeguard for six summers. So I know how to handle a situation, but I mean, it could have been really, really bad. And for those that aren't long-term listeners to the show, you and your lacrosse coach were really close. This is the equivalent of telling like a trusted adult or even a parent. Yes. She was very, very helpful in your recovery. Yes, very much so. Really, very really. much so. And I, I don't know how much she really even realizes that, but I do talk about her a lot. And she was very, very, very helpful. You should send her this podcast. I will. I will. You should be like, because of you, I'm able to act insane on the internet with a bipolar guy. I, yeah, I could send her that. I could, <laughs> I could, you know. She was really proud of me when I got into Inside Lacrosse Magazine because I did mention her in that one too. She's probably more excited about that than this show. Probably, probably, yeah. Want to learn more about mental health, mental illness, and psychology, but not be bored? The Psych Central Show is an award-winning podcast that speaks candidly with experts in these fields to break down complex topics into easily understood nuggets of useful information. Hosted by our very own Gabe Howard along with Vincent M. Wales. Available on your favorite podcast player or at psychcentral.com slash show. Okay, Gabe, what is your crazy story for number two? You know, let, let's, keep, let's keep the lights low for a moment. Let, let's keep the, the non-existent violin playing in the background. Really? That's what a violin sounds like to you? I don't know. What a, I don't even know. If that's what a violin sounds like to you, I'm curious as to what God sounded like to you. Shut up. I hate you. <laughs> I Shut know up. You the, it happened. I, I believe you because of schizophrenia. <laughs> when I'm really, really depressed, you know, I, I don't leave the house. I don't talk on podcasts. And, and before I was diagnosed, I, I slipped into levels of depression that I can best describe by physical symptoms. Uh, one, I have trichotillomania, which is which is hair twirling, hair pulling, and when I'm really, really bad, I, I literally pull out clumps of my own hair. I mean, I'm I'm holding the clumps, and then I go up looking for more. Uh, of course, you know, I I weighed well over 500 pounds, almost 550 pounds, and I would lay in my bed for days. I I wouldn't shower. If I was awake, I was crying and yelling at things that weren't there because I was so despondent and terrified. And I, I would literally... Who the are you yelling at? D the wall. Okay. The wall. And, you know, sometimes I would get up to go to the bathroom. Other times I would piss myself. I, I just, I, I, I want to be clear to all the fans. I, I never did number two in my bed. This is really hard to talk about. I mean, it really is the idea that I could be laying in my own misery and filth. I mean, when I would finally get into a shower after a couple of weeks, the dead skin would would slough off me like it was it, it was a paste. Jeez. It was this is so is, gross, Gabe. You've been married three times. Now you know why. Jeez, <laughs> nasty skin falling off you, pee in the bed and everything. God, I, you, I, 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 Demi Lovato doesn't want that game. Yeah, Demi yeah, Demi Lovato. <laughs> Demi Lovato <laughs> moved right on. Demi Lovato, do not listen to this episode <laughs> because you will not be Gabe's fourth wife. Listen, it's, it's, been, it's been 15 years at least since that's happened. This was long before I went to the psychiatric hospital. This was long before I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And I had issues like this at home. You know, my parents talked about how filthy I would get or how filthy my room would get. But because I lived with them, you know, mom would finally corral me into a shower uh, something would happen because they were around and they could run some sort of interference. Just they could do something. So it never got that bad. But when I was all alone, when my first wife left me and I was in, I was just in the house and I just, I couldn't move and nobody came to check on me and nobody noticed I was gone and nobody Aww. cared. And the, the thing is, this is what depression looks like. And it's yeah. because you're balled up in a corner of your own house, in your own room, in your own place, nobody sees it. By the time you surface again, you've taken the shower, you've thrown away the sheets, you've uh, replaced the mattress. So nobody sees you when you're really, 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 really bad. Again, not to bring everybody down, anybody that would have walked into that room 
at the end of week two wouldn't say you're faking because that's yeah. it's, it's just not something you can fake it's and i don't know i i think honestly i was so depressed i didn't even have the strength to kill myself wow. but i absolutely wanted to die and it, you're just not going to record a podcast or write a blog or go on a speaking tour when you feel that way. So that's just not the kind of thing the public can see. Yeah, that's why, I, like I say, I had good roommates in college because I believe the day after October 3rd, 2009, October 4th, 2009, I was in my room with the blinds down until like four in the afternoon until my roommates popped in and said, what's going on? Why are you depressed? What happened? Let's talk. And I mean, thank God I had them. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have never gotten out of bed. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Without the people in my life, I would not be here. We, we've said it probably on every show where we talk about our more serious symptoms, and, and I can't reiterate it enough. I know that I'm here because I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that I owe a big debt to all of the people around me. Absolutely. Let's not give them like too big of a head, though, because we have to see these people at like family functions and stuff, and I don't want them to be like, aww, Gabe and Michelle love us. So just, just, just. Simmer down, Grandma. My, my friends like to say, oh, I feel so famous when you talk about me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay. My friends roll their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have different friends. <laughs> Michelle, let's talk about coffee. I know oh, coffee. how much you love coffee. Michelle, you have a great Starbucks story, don't you? I do. Again, I was 22 and unmedicated. <laughs> <laughs> All the best stories start that way, it seems. When I was 22 and unmedicated. That's the name of your book. If you ever write a book, it's going to be called 22 and Unmedicated by Michelle. Not even Michelle Hammer, just Michelle. 22 and Unmedicated. All right. So I go into a Starbucks, as many people do, and got coffee, and then sat down, like many people do. And then I didn't even realize it, but apparently I went delusional and started having a conversation with myself. And I was cracking up at this conversation, hilariously talking and laughing. And it was like I was talking to the funniest person who wasn't even there. I was just having the best time. And a man walks up to me. I remember he was wearing all white. He was just some dude wearing all white. And he just goes, I just want to let you know that you have the greatest energy that I have ever seen. And I just had to let you know that. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And I didn't even realize why he said that to me. And I was like, oh, I was just talking to myself and I was laughing hysterically. And he just noticed that. Uh, at least he had a good thing to say to me and it wasn't thinking, why is that crazy girl just talking to herself at that Starbucks chair right there? But no, okay. Well, something positive came out of it, I guess. I, there, there's a couple of things that I want to say. First, the, the, the gentleman in all white, was he an old guy with a long white beard? No, he was like a young guy in his okay. 20s. So, so not God? Not God, not God. Just happened to be wearing all white. Just happened to be wearing all white. Okay, just, just making Soho. sure. In so, it was in, in Soho, in Manhattan, in New York, in the United States. So let's sidebar this for a moment because it, you have a slight advantage here in that you know, you're young, you're thin, you're a pretty white girl. And how do you think the people around you would have reacted if you would have been like my size, you know, like a, a 300 pound man. And instead of laughing, what if the voices were negative? What if I was, you know, like in an oh. argument with myself and rocking back and forth and, you know, just, just swearing and I hate you. Like, just stop it. Just, just quit it. I would have been kicked out of Starbucks. Well, you would have just been kicked out of Starbucks, but what about well, I mean, you, they would, they would, they'd say there's a man in here and he needs to leave. They would say, kick that guy out. Right. So then they would have been aggressive to me to get me to leave. And here in my delusional state, because, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm clearly in an argument with myself at that point. Maybe I don't understand they're asking me to leave. Maybe I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, I can see how people in psychosis can get easily arrested or worse because they're having a symptom of their illness. I, I think the advantage that you had that day is that your story is kind of funny because you were laughing and it seemed like the delusion was very positive. And, you know, like I said, you're just young and adorable. And somebody thought, oh, she's having a lot of fun. He probably didn't think there was anything quote unquote crazy about you. He probably thought you were listening to something on your headphones. Could have been, could have been. Yeah, he could have yeah. maybe thought I was on the phone or just anything. I have no idea. Because why did he think I was laughing at nothing? Did he think I was talking to someone? Who knows, right? Yeah, and when he looked over, he wasn't afraid. 
No, not at all. He yeah. was just telling you that I had great energy. Right. I, just, I didn't even know what he was talking about because I was completely unaware that I was doing that until I thought about it. And I go, oh, I was talking to myself. Oh, I guess I was having a good chat. Okay. <laughs> And this is something that even, you know, let, let's move years later, you're now medicated. This is something that not to the same extent, but this is something that you still deal with on a daily basis. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll be on the subway and like, I'll try to wear headphones and sunglasses. So I can't make eye contact with anybody, but I'll laugh to myself and everything on the subway. But I try to, hopefully people are thinking I'm just laughing at what I'm listening to on my headphones. But I've been like laughing and stuff on the subway. I'll look up and I'll have four people staring at me. You like, should charge. You should, you should be like, hey, it's, it's $5 a ticket. Like, we have to find a way to monetize this. I'm sure. sure. Subway chats with no one. $5 <laughs> each. Get a ticket now. <laughs> I think we found our next business plan. Okay, Gabe. What's, what is your next story, Gabe? I'm very, very interested to hear your next story. You know, I, I, when I was unmedicated, I, I suffered from psychosis as well. I, I had very strong delusions and, and paranoid delusions. My delusions sort of manifested themselves into what I called demons. I could never catch the demons. I never saw the demons, but I was positive they were there and they were hurting me. Every bad thing that happened to me, every negative feeling that I had, anytime I didn't get my way, just anything. If my favorite show was canceled, the demons did it. If I couldn't sleep, the demons did it. I was as sure that there were demons following me around and screwing with my life as I am that your name is Michelle Hammer. When I started to get medicated, they didn't go away all at once. So, you know, now I'm diagnosed. I've been given a diagnosis of bipolar. I've been put on my first antipsychotic. I got my first psychiatric meds. It's six months later and the demons are starting to fade. The demons are gone, but I felt strongly that the demons were trying to make a comeback. So just because the demons were gone doesn't mean that they weren't trying to manifest into something else. So one day I'm sitting at work. I work on the, at this time I worked on the 13th floor of a building downtown and it, it was a Wednesday and the window washers come every Monday. But for whatever reason that I still have no idea, the window washers were there on Wednesday. They uh -huh. were there. They were there. They were supposed to come on Monday. Oh no, they came so on the wrong day. They did. The so I was, day. I was positive that these weren't the window washers at all. They, they were the demons that took over the window washers so that they could get to me through the window washer stuff. I, I, I don't know why they didn't become like a security guard at the building I worked at. That would have been easier, but that's all it took. The knowledge that the window washers were there on a different day than they usually are immediately became this is the new demon, they're out to get me, and I literally fled. I fled from the building. I, I, I tried for two or three minutes to, to figure it out. I asked for help. I remember calling my friend and I said, that they're, they're here, they're trying to get me. She tried to calm me down and I just, I hung up on her and I yelled to my supervisor that I was sick and I had to go. And I ran out of the building down 13, I took the elevator down 13, I, 13 flights, I, I ran to my car, I got in my car, and I drove home ridiculously fast, and I climbed under the bed where I stayed for the next three days. Whoa. Because I was, and I wouldn't move. I wouldn't move, I, I wouldn't move. And I, I, I do recall moving to go to the bathroom, but I, I was terrified. Wow. They were out to get me. And my friend came and tried to help me with stuff, but I, I was positive that, that she let them in, that she told them where I worked. She, to this day, says that it was one of the most frightening things that she ever saw because it was just so scary and so sad that I was so terrified over nothing. It was just wow. nothing. Um, eventually, she did get me to the hospital where, where they, they, they fixed my medication. They, they kept me for like a day. I wasn't really admitted. The, the demons were probably the most terrifying thing that I ever dealt with. And it, they're probably the thing that I'm most terrified that's going to come back. The demons. The demons. See, the demons. The demons. And you know what sucks? I think about this a lot when, when I'm, you know, when I'm, now that I'm well. And why couldn't the movie Despicable Me come out before I invented the demons? Because then maybe I would have invented the minions. Maybe my mind would have had a delusion that instead of demons trying to kill me, they were minions trying to help me take over the world. But no. 
that movie couldn't exist. So I had like Dementors. Now that movie didn't exist either, but that's, I don't know what the, what the demons looked like, but they were freaking terrifying, Michelle. That's, terrifying. That's crazy. That's crazy. That demons be following you. Uh, no, that's nuts. I, pref I prefer if you say that I was a person who was living with crazy. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> I, I, I don't like it when, when you say that I'm crazy. It's very- Oh, sh oh shut up. <laughs> so you're crazy. Let's all be PC. Uh, what's PC what stand for? Psych Central. Yes, yes. And speaking of Psych Central, remember you can find other episodes of the Bipolar Schizophrenic and a podcast at psychcentral.com slash BSP. If you can head on over to iTunes and subscribe, we would like that or leave us a nice comment. Every time you leave a comment, Michelle reads it and she becomes just hysterically happy. Hysterically. Hysterically happy. Hysterically. It's because she's a woman. It's because I'm 22 and unmedicated. <laughs> Thanks everyone and we will see you next week. It was real. You've been listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. If you love this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Head over to iTunes or your preferred podcast app to subscribe, rate, and review. To work with Gabe, go to GabeHoward.com. To work with Michelle, go to Schizophrenic.nyc. For free mental health resources and online support groups, head over to PsychCentral.com. The show's official website is PsychCentral.com slash BSP. You can email us at show at PsychCentral.com. Thank you for listening, and share widely.